it's hard to believe that it's been 14 months since we started our challenge where we thought we would try to live as self-sufficiently as we could by growing our own food, foraging for our food, bartering for things that we can't grow or produce here, and then selling our excess and purchasing things that we just cannot grow in our climate or that it would be impossible to grow enough of to sustain us. So things like coffee, salt, sugar, vinegar, all my spices, coconut products, chocolate, <laughs> things like that, um, and, and flour and all my other grains and legumes. So things like that that are kind of pantry staples that I kind of needed to get me through this. It's really hard to be self-sufficient entirely by yourself. I want to touch on that a bit later, but um, I wanted to make it as easy as I could so I wouldn't get overwhelmed because I have tried this before and I failed because I wanted to be totally self-sufficient on our own farm and not kind of rely on any of the other things like foraging or bartering or purchasing with funds that I make from selling my produce which um, is being self-sufficient because I'm making money from my garden to purchase those things but I have tried and I have failed before um, so I thought that by adding in those four elements that I could create a system that would be self-reliant and self-perpetuating and could be sustainable in the long term, not just for the year, but beyond the year. The year was there because I needed a kick up the butt to stop letting produce that I was growing go to waste and not utilizing it. Prior to the challenge, um, we were still relying on the supermarket and because we are so far out from the supermarket, not as far as a lot of people, but we're about 30 minutes to a decent store. And the stores that I like to shop at um, is only open a few days a week. So even navigating that was difficult. So, um, so I would do a big bulk shop and I would do it fortnightly or three weekly um, prior to our bin collection. So um, our bin collection, we collect the supermarket waste and we go twice a week now. Prior to that, we weren't going into town and I wasn't, um, I didn't want to go in just to kind of pick up a, a couple of litres of milk. So um, prior to the bin collection that we now do regularly and I can go into town and go into the shop, um, I would only go fortnightly or, or yeah, uh, once or twice a month. So I was doing this big shop and I felt because I was spending all this money on food, about 300 a week on food, that was fruit, veg, meat, before we were um, raising our own and that was here on this property um, and then all my dry goods. And I felt like because I was spending all this money on food that I didn't want to go, I didn't want that to go to waste. So I was kind of neglecting what I was growing in my garden, even though there was quite a bit of food in here and I wasn't being very creative, let's be honest. So I needed a really big kick up the butt so I could step away from that um, monopoly market that I really didn't want to feed into. We don't want to feed into this consumerist mindset. We don't want to be consuming, consuming, consuming and not being um, self-sufficient or self-reliant in producing our own food. So. I thought that by saying no more supermarkets um, and we will only eat what we grow would be a nice little introduction into this lifestyle that we're now living. And it really worked. Um, I need those kind of big things to make me do big things. <laughs> um, so I just kept using what was in my pantry, I kept growing as much as I could. It was the beginning of spring, so things were slow in the garden, as they are, well, things were starting to take off, but things are a bit slow at this time of year here. We are in a cool, temperate area in Australia. We're not in a really hot area. It gets really hot over summer, but um, through late autumn, through winter and um, early spring, it is quite cool here. We even got snow this year, which is quite a treat here in Australia. Um, I know it snows in lots of places around the world and maybe that can get annoying for you, but it snowed twice here. It didn't really stay on the ground for long, but yeah, it's, it's hard to grow in that. I think a lot of people can attest to that, to grow in those cool conditions. Things grow slowly, you get a lot of slug and snail attacks, a lot of pest attacks, and yeah, it's just 
it's hard. <laughs> um, so we started off in spring and through that, through just living it, um, people were interested in our journey and they wanted to take part and they wanted to trade. Um, they saw that we had a lot of excess, a surplus, um, and they were willing to take part and they were really excited about it because it's something that a lot of people want to do but they don't know how to get there and they see you doing it and they want to take part of that. And that was really exciting, um, seeing all those organic relationships blossom through this challenge. Um, now, it went really well. Um, we succeeded. We um, were able to sell enough to buy what we needed and we were able to produce enough meat and veggies to um, get us through. And we even preserved a heap as well. So that was nice. That got us through this winter period. It is definitely something that we're going to keep on doing. Um, this was just the start <laughs> of the reason why we moved out here. We moved out here to be self-sufficient. It's really hard to take that step and to trust that you can do it and to trust that your garden will produce enough for you and that you'll be able to um, make the relationships to make this work. We are a little bit more flexible now where <laughs> I've decided that I can buy luxuries like pasta um, where I was making that before and it was difficult, it was time consuming um, when now I can go, oh, I don't have much time <clears throat> to make dinner, um, a packet of pasta makes that process so much easier and quicker. So that's been a huge blessing, um, allowing myself those few luxuries. <laughs> I want to talk about how I believe that you cannot ever be fully self-sufficient. I know it's a little bit controversial considering the topic that I'm talking about, but one person can never provide all the food that they need. Of course I could just eat meat and veg, but what's the fun in that? I need a bit of chocolate <laughs> and I need some other things that we can't produce here, but my neighbors or my friends down the road, they might be able to produce those things that I can't produce here on the farm and establishing that community and those relationships, especially in times like 2020 that we've seen this year, um, where people went crazy because they thought that they wouldn't be able to go to the supermarket in some places they couldn't and um, how they thought food was gonna run out and how they looked at their family situation and um, what that would look like if they couldn't access food. I mean, that's really scary. I, I totally get that. If I didn't have this set up, I would have been panicking too. I would have been at the supermarket buying as much as I could um, to make sure that if we couldn't leave the house for a couple of weeks or a couple of months that we could still eat something. But establishing those relationships has really got us through. Um, I want to describe a few of them. <laughs> um, we trade lamb for beef, which is great because if we pop a whole cow in the freezer, that's two years worth of meat and it can go off, it can get freezer burn, I could have something go wrong with the freezer early on in the two year stint and um, I could lose all that meat. So having half a steer in there, that's about 10 months worth and then we put our own lambs in. I've traded a rooster um, for a leg of pork before we produced our own. Um, I've, I've swapped eggs and veggies for other fruits and veggies um, and eggs when my chickens weren't laying. Um, I swapped plants for fruit and veggies and received that in return as well. I swapped some plants for a gorgeous um, pouch that I could wear and put all my tools in when I'm gardening. Um, yeah, there's just been a whole um, host of community that's come together and it's been really wonderful because that's the reason why we moved out here. We, we moved out here for community. We moved out here to live this lifestyle of being self-reliant um, in this beautiful place that we call home. I do want to take you on a tour of my pantry. So let's go have a look at that now. So this is my pantry. As you can see, it's very full. I've got stores of rice and frica, some nuts in there, all my sauces, condiments and olive oil. In here I have my legumes and some of my extra, extra rice products and sushi wrappers and rice paper rolls and noodles. Got a little bit of flour down here, my cooking wine. And in here I've got a little bit more frica, a little bit of salt, some beans, some cacao, some coconut milk powder, some coconut flour in that long container. 
in this cupboard I've got some of my extra honey, some tomato paste that I purchased because I didn't have a great season, um, some of my preserves, and then in this drawer I've got some of more of my nuts and seeds and oats and cereal. That's another luxury that I've decided that I can buy. Nice and quick for the kids. And down here I've got my teas and my spices. In this corner pantry I've got my extra tallow, my tomato paste, a little bit extra that I bought, a lot of my empty jars, a lot of my preserves, more preserves. And then up here I've got a little bit more honey, my scobies and some more tallow, my spare egg cartons and some wax from our bees from last year. This is a little bit of an awkward space but this is my extras cupboard so everything that I have double of comes in here so I have more honey from last season some more noodles and um, they're great in soups and stuff and a stir fry with lots of veggies um, some flour in the back some of my vinegar I decided to go with this vinegar I want to talk about that quickly um, it is the only natural naturally fermented vinegar I can find here in Australia um, it is expensive it's about four dollars for that two litre bottle way more expensive than say something like this you can get um, a different type not the double strength you can get just the regular distilled vinegar and that is like a dollar for two liters this one's a couple of bucks it's double strength I thought I'd get that it's all I could get at one stage but now that I can get this brand again I've gone with this because I like that it's naturally fermented and not distilled a um, couple of cans of tuna make some sushi with that with some cucumbers from the garden really quick and easy lunch a few more of my um, condiments some more seeds and nuts I've only got one block of chocolate left a couple of packs of cereal now that we can eat that again a um, couple of cases of tomato paste and then all my spices some more oil and some more condiments and baking bits some coconut oil, rolled oats in the corner there, a heap more vinegar. I've got split peas, um, barley and beans. I've got more beans there in the corner with a little bit of rice. A couple of bags of rice here, one's El Borio um, for risotto and sushi and for creamy rice um, that we put rhubarb on top from the garden. And this is a bag of oats. Um, unfortunately, these aren't really good. <laughs> they were much more expensive than the supermarket oats. Um, even though I bought a big 20 kilo bag worth, they just don't, they're just really gross when you cook them. But anyway, we're getting through them because we need to get through them. Um, I've got a couple of boxes of sugar and then I've got a box of dates and some pasta. So that is what is in my pantry and how I've stocked it up. And I'll probably try and keep it this stocked up. So in total, let's give you the numbers of what I spent on food in a year. So I spent $2,140.48 Australian, which equates to $1,524.34 US. Broken down, that's $178.37 Australian a month, which is $127.03 US a month. And weekly, that works out to $41.16 Australian which is $29.31 US a week. <laughs> I want to say that my pantry is more stocked now than it was before. The reason for that is because um, we weren't sure, originally we didn't want to stock the pantry. We were like, we're not buying into this whole crazy panic buying stuff. We're not interested. Um, it's not for us. We're not worried. Um, but on closer inspection we thought if this is something that we think is going to be serious for us now or in the future this isn't over yet um, and there's a few other things around this that isn't over yet too if we feel like we can't go out for whatever reason to purchase some sugar and some salt some vinegar to preserve our produce we want to make sure that we have that here for you know a certain amount of time that we could preserve for or eat for without venturing out. Um, so we decided that would stock up on salt, sugar, vinegar, 
flowers, legumes, um, grains, what else? A few other bits and pieces like chocolate, <laughs> cacao, um, coconut oil, um, apple cider vinegar, uh, what else is in there? There's a few other bits and pieces, a few other different condiments and sauces that we enjoy. We don't, we could live without them, we don't need them to survive, but we enjoy them for now and we can stock up the pantry with those. We decided to do that after the panic buying um, finished because we wanted those that weren't as lucky as us to have food um, or have access to food. Uh, we wanted them to be able to meet their needs. A lot of elderly people, a lot of um, first responders were missing out due to their hours or just because they weren't quick enough to grab things off the shelf. So we kind of left that space there and then once things calmed down and um, supermarkets were fully restocked again we decided that yep it's time we could go purchase what we need. During that time when it first started here in Australia it was March and um, I believe it was March 17 um, <laughs> and that was right at the time that I needed to preserve my summer harvest. March is the beginning of autumn and that is the beginning of my knuckling down and let's get all this surplus produce that I've spent so long growing and I've worked so hard to, to harvest and, and store or even just get to that point. Um, and I couldn't, I couldn't get sugar, I couldn't get vinegar and I was running out. I had like two litres of vinegar left and a couple of kilos of sugar and it just wasn't enough to get me through and to get everything into storage which I really needed. I mean this is why I'm here. This is why I'm growing all this food so I can store it, so I can eat it, so I can use it for winter when I can't grow as much. And so that was really eye-opening to the fact that yeah actually maybe I do need to have a bit of a prepper's pantry. I do need to have things in there that I use all the time and that are essential to keep this going. So um, so even now I'm, I'm purchasing a couple of litres of vinegar and a couple of kilos of sugar a week and I'll keep doing that until um, I feel like I have enough for summer, for summer 2021, um, 2020 and 2021. Um, so I don't have too much more that I have to get. I don't, I feel like I don't have too much more that I need to get in that regard. How are we going to go moving forward? Are we going to keep doing this? Is this just a really nice year and hey, see you later, let's just go eat convenient food again. This is something that we moved out here to do. So this is something that we are definitely going to keep doing and we still are. We're, we're two months, um, after, or nearly two months after the challenge ended and uh, we're still doing things like we were six months ago. Um, so we're still eating from the land. I've got lots of brassicas um, coming on at the moment. So that's making up the staple of our veggies at the moment. A lot of greens, a lot of um, leeks and and onions and that sort of stuff. Um, so this is definitely something that we want to keep doing. While we can, we'll still eat um, pantry staples or still use them. Maybe we'll come to a time that we can't get those or that um, we can't access those. I mean, this might happen again. Something else might happen again and we can't access those. But for now, we'll incorporate the pantry staples into our life. Um, and yeah, we'll keep it stocked up and have a bit of a preppers pantry there. Not Nothing too serious, um, no gas masks, uh, just a bit of extra food. So if we were stuck here for a couple months that, hey, everything would be okay. And we could even get the garden producing a little bit more um, if we needed to and, and have those in there to get us through the, that period. Because um, as we saw at the beginning of these lockdowns in March, um, a lot of people went crazy and purchased all the seeds. I couldn't even get any seeds. It was nuts. So I have stocked up on seeds. Um, you couldn't get any seedlings. Not that I buy those sorts of seedlings. Um, I buy them from a local lady. If I do buy them, um, <laughs> you couldn't buy trees at one stage. You couldn't buy soil or potting mix. Um, even the greenhouse place where I get all my um, market garden supplies from, they were getting run off their feet. Um, so I think that when you have new gardeners like that, inexperienced gardeners, they think, oh, I can just plant something and we'll eat food in a couple of months. It, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> I'm sorry. It doesn't. Um, you know, these cabbages and the cauliflowers, I planted them in December. 
seeds December last year, December to February for me in my climate. So I can start harvesting them now in October. It's nearly November in a couple of days and some of them are even going to be ready in December. So, um, you know, that is a year, a year's worth of work there. And um, it just, you know, it's just not going to vanish. It's, not, it's just not going to magically appear on your plate um, or in your garden. So tomatoes only grow at a certain time of year. Zucchini seeds were being sown. I mean, I've tried that before in my hothouse and it didn't work, but people were starting to grow zucchinis in, in March and that's just not when you grow zucchinis here in Australia, not in Southern Australia anyway. Um, and so there was a lot of lack of knowledge and I feel that people might be discouraged from that. It's hard, really, really hard to grow through winter. Um, a lot of people struggle. I don't mind growing through winter. I feel like I can sit and forget. Um, it's kind of like my lazy period of gardening <laughs> um, because I don't need a water where I am. Um, the soil is really happy. I can plonk everything in, mulch it, leave it and start harvesting six months later. Um, but I feel like a lot of people might have been discouraged. I've, I've driven past some new gardens and they're really sad. They, they were gung-ho at the beginning and now they're really sad. And I wonder if um, they're going to bother in spring or summer to try and produce some of their own food. It doesn't matter if your garden's really small, but um, it's just keeping at it, um, keeping on it, rotationally grazing, successively planting, which is really hard. It's something that you learn um, with experience <laughs> and I've had a bit of experience in the garden. If you've made it this far thank you so much for watching and if you are one of those beginner gardeners that I was talking about earlier and you have struggled through winter please don't give up keep going it's so much fun it's so rewarding especially through this time of year and if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to me on Instagram at living underscore the underscore dream underscore permaculture and I'd be happy to chat to you through any of your problems, any of your concerns, any of your questions. And I'll leave that link down in the description below so you can find me there easily. Thank you guys.